Very good morning to you. Let's uh, take you back now to the events of uh, March 2020. Tomorrow will mark exactly uh, two years since South Africa discovered uh, this virus on the shores of South Africa. The former health minister, Dr. William Kize, announcing the first positive case of COVID-19 in the country at that time. Two years later, uh, the former head of the ministerial advisory committee and uh, a world-renowned epidemiologist, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, says the country has done well in dealing with the virus. He joins me now to take us back into time. But, uh, uh, Prof, very good morning to you. Before we go to where South Africa is right now in the management of the COVID-19 virus, take us back to March 2020. Uh, I know that the anniversary of the actual discovery of the first case in South Africa will be tomorrow. But uh, do you remember where you were when the country announced its first case? Yes, good morning, Polly, and good morning to all of the viewers. I remember the time and the event very clearly. I had received a message from the National Institutes for Communicable Diseases uh, about it. And um, I was in the laboratory at the time. Mm. We had, at the Caprisa Laboratories, converted our HIV testing machines to doing COVID testing. We had been doing COVID testing since the middle of February. And so I was in the lab with the team when we got the message that the first patient had been identified. Yeah, December 2019 would have been the discovery of this very virus in Wuhan, China. And your comments back then were somewhat along the lines of, well, we think that China would have a handle on this virus. And two years down the line, well, the world has had to deal with a very, very deadly virus. Uh, your thoughts around whether or not this could have been contained in Wuhan, or is that something that we shouldn't even touch on now? No, I think it's a, a very important issue to uh, discuss and reflect on. When um, I received the first notification of this, I think it was on the 30th of December, I was uh, uh, hiking in the Drakensberg with my family, mm. and it was on one of the trails my I watch gives me a ProMed alert about this. And so I stop on the trail and I just look at the message and it talks about cases of unidentified pneumonia in Wuhan in China. Mm. And when I looked at it, I thought, well, this in all likelihood is probably, you know, SARS. And I didn't give it a second thought because I thought, you know, if it's SARS, the Chinese have dealt with it before. Yeah. But it was, you know, only about a week and a half later that I realized that this was a different virus and that this had the potential to spread. I'm not sure if it could really have been contained. Now that we've seen the way in which the first cases spread from the seafood market. There are a superb set of papers, three papers released last week mm. that show how concentrically over a matter of two weeks, the virus literally in concentric circles spread from the Wuhan seafood market. That was the best opportunity to control it. But once we couldn't control it there, once the Chinese were not able to control it, largely because they, weren't know, they didn't know what they were dealing with, that it became very hard after that to control. We've learned that ourselves. When we discovered uh, Omicron in students in Chuane, we tried to control the Omicron epidemic. But as you know, it's now a worldwide pandemic of Omicron. Yeah. Prof, I listen with interest what you're saying that I think you've said three papers have now re been released on the discovery of this virus in Wuhan's seafood market. Is that now a conclusive uh, story about the origins of this virus? Because I remember some time ago, Chinese authorities uh, somewhat being difficult in allowing those people who were investigating the origins of COVID-19. Uh, is that now the finality to this, that indeed the discovery or the 
um, the first uh, discovery of this virus was indeed in Wuhan, China. So I think, uh, you know, what, when the WHO sent its team to go and investigate the origins in China, I thought that the behavior of the Chinese authorities was really unacceptable mm. in that we would have expected greater cooperation and their information to be made available. For example, the logbooks in the Chinese Wuhan laboratories, which the Chinese refused to make available. And so that's what's led to you know, rumors spreading and conspiracy spreading that, the, that they might have been from a lab. But I think we've, we've known because SARS-1 and MERS, which are both coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 that come from bats, we know that it probably has and most likely has an animal origin coming from bats going through an intermediate host. And so that was always the likely explanation. Yeah. But I think up to this day, because the Chinese have not been transparent, we have not excluded the laboratory leak. But as new evidence becomes available, like, like last week, it certainly strengthens and makes the, the natural spillover from animals into humans the most likely explanation. I don't want to get you into trouble, Prof, <laughs> but the, the element you've just said is quite interesting that the world cannot exactly exclude a possibility of a laboratory link or leak rather of this uh, is that something that you think china might allow outsiders to try and investigate further you mentioned their difficulty uh, allowing who officials getting into the country in particular uh, the areas where it was thought to have originated <laughs> I think we, we, can't tell, we can't exclude that possibility. It's unlikely. Uh, when you look at the sequence, it's very unlikely that this could have been made in the laboratory, even with gain-of-function studies. But we cannot exclude it. In fact, up to this day, people still debate with me whether HIV was made in a laboratory in the US CDC. And there's a whole lot of evidence that they provide that you know the child that the US CDC had the African green monkeys, they actually had this virus in their stocks. I mean, you could go on. If you want to make a conspiracy mm. from the evidence that's available, it's very easy to make that conspiracy. But if we look at what's the likely situation, it is very likely and the most uh, you know the highest likelihood is that it comes from animals through a natural spillover. Sure. Very interesting thoughts indeed. Let's uh, then come back to uh, March 2022, Professor, and let's talk about South Africa's management of this virus. How have we done? So I've been involved in looking at several countries' responses uh, as part of a range of activities that I've been involved in, including uh, work on future scenarios at the International Science Council, uh, work in the WHO Science Council, work in the Lancet Commission, in the African Commission on COVID-19. I've been looking at, uh, that's it now, close on to 30, 40 different countries and how they've been responding. Mm. And I think we've learned that, I mean, almost all countries have made mistakes. That's not almost all, all have, uh, including South Africa. Mm. And I think when you look at the way in which each of these countries dealt with it, you know, probably bottom of the pile in terms of responding appropriately, you know, would feature uh, you know, Donald Trump's United States and uh, Brazil under Bolsonaro. Both those responses just fundamentally fail to understand mm. the essential ingredients of what it would take to slow the virus down. The positive uh, efforts that were made were countries like Vietnam, uh, New Zealand, but even those countries, I mean, New Zealand right now is dealing with a major outbreak of uh, Omicron. Mm. So even those countries have had their fair share of errors. So I think overall, when we look at South Africa, we have done quite well. We can be quite proud of 
you know, South Africa's got many scientists who have made important contributions. We have uh, public health systems that were put in place to help. You know, we've we've had our fair share of failures. I I wouldn't want to delve into it, but if you just look at some of the fundamental challenges we experienced right from the first wave mm. was the challenges in ensuring we have adequate beds in the Eastern Cape, as an example yeah. of a health system that was collapsing even before COVID-19 was put to the sword and just struggled during the COVID-19 waves. So I think overall, we've had our fair share of challenges. For me, what is an issue is how do we think about the virus going forward? Yeah. What do we what do we what do we reflect on as the lessons we've learned and how do we reflect on what the future lies and for me that's what's most important right now and that exactly is the point prof that i want us to end the conversation on the management of this virus going forward uh, because I do tend to think in my head, just my own behavior, that there's a bit of a laxity. And I suspect I might not be alone in that. But before we get there, Prof, you speak about the leadership and particularly that kind of leadership in the management of this virus. You've spoken about Brazil, uh, the president there, Bolsonaro and others. I can't not ask you a question about the management at leadership level of this virus in South Africa. We know the person who was health minister at the time that this virus hit us. In fact, he did so well at the time that he was even named man of the year by a very respected publication. Was it a disappointment for you to see him go, not because of the failure to manage the virus, but rather other elements very very deeply disappointing I, I would never have imagined his involvement in any of the things that were said uh, it came as a huge shock and the evidence is quite strong mm -hmm. so I think we have as a country seen how corruption that we knew was a whole problem before COVID yeah. seeped into COVID, used COVID as a cover to personally enrich individuals. And I mean, you know, each one of the health departments at a provincial level in their PPE scandals just illustrate this problem that we have. And we're not going to fix that problem with, you know, in COVID. It's a problem we have to fix as a country. We have to put you know, the corrupt individuals in orange overalls. If we don't do that, it's a scourge that continues because they feel they can do so in, you know, that there they are no consequences for their behavior. But I would say overall, I mean, we've, so we've had our problems. Yeah. We've had, for example, one of the things that deeply, deeply disappointed me was the way in which the Collins Corsa matter was dealt with. Yeah. That he was that he was killed by our own forces that whose job it is to protect us. Mm. That we had these PPE scandals that, I mean, just all of those things, they hurt to the core. But I think we have, we have to rise above those challenges. We have to try and fix them so they don't recur, but we have to rise above them. Because we've done many great things. Just think about the transparency, the way in which we have communicated with the public. We've been open about the problems, the, the successes, the challenges, mm -hmm. and the way in which our science has played an important role in all of that has been really heartening to me. It, it, it lays a good foundation for how we'll deal with the next pandemic, in fact. Yeah, Prof, I, I suspect many South Africans are going to really appreciate you for uh, the candidate nature of how you have reflected on this. Let's um, conclude the conversation then, Prof, and talk about the management of this virus going forward. I spoke about myself and just fatigue, I suspect. Uh, sometimes I wear a mask, sometimes I don't. That probably is the general behavior out there. I'm saying those words very guardedly. Some people very, very strict about it. H how should we manage this going forward, both 
at leadership level in government and at a personal level? So, Tolly, you're not alone. I think everyone uh, around the world, not just in South Africa, but everywhere, I mean, every kind, just coming from, you know, I've been in, in Germany, in the US, in Vietnam, Singapore, I mean, all of these countries, people are fed up. Mm. They are fed up. And they've had enough, they've had it with this virus. The problem is that the virus hasn't had it with us. It's not done with us. It is going to continue to spread. And the reason it's going to do that is because it can mutate. And because its ability to mutate gives it some advantages over the previous variants, it will continue to mutate. The problem is we don't know what the next variants will look like. We don't know, is it going to be a mild disease? Is it going to be a severe disease? We have to bank on our vaccines to protect us. And in our country, we've got to do a lot better in getting higher vaccine coverage because that's our strongest protection. And, you know, and even though we've got natural infection, people tell me, oh, I've had uh, infection. I said, that's not good enough. Mm. You've got to be vaccinated in addition to natural infection to get protection that's really good. And there are, there's a superb study in the New England Journal of Medicine that shows that, that if you just have past infection, the protection is much lower than if you are vaccinated with past infection. So we have to be thinking about how is it we're going to do that. And improving vaccine coverage is not one person's job or one institution's job. Mm. It's the whole of society. It's your role. It's my role. It's every one of us. Every person we know that is not vaccinated, we have to help them. Either give them information, facilitate their vaccination, but that's our protection. Because we have to wait until we get to a point where the virus cannot mutate any further with advantages. And we don't know when that's going to occur, but it's going to occur. It's very unlikely that the virus can just carry on mutating forever and ever. Yeah. Viruses don't do that. Uh, mutate forever with advantage. It'll continue mutating, but not with advantage. So we wait for that point because at that point we can now we can change the way in which we look at this infection going forward. World-renowned epidemiologist, that's uh, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. I really do appreciate your time, sir, and your reflections. Let's change our attention now and look at this. And uh, it is the on